still the God that walks us through. And he does not say, you go ahead, I'll meet you on the other side. Right? He said, I will be right there with you. He said, you walk through the waters, they'll not overtake you. Walk through the fires, you won't be burned. Why is that? Because he's walking us through. And I'm thankful for that this evening. We want to go back. Same text we had this morning. John chapter 6, verse number 63. I preached to you this morning, spirit and life. want to uh, just kind of continue on with that thought a little bit. Different title tonight, but uh, just continuing that thought. I kind of brought you... Uh, to a, a position and a place this morning. We stopped there, and uh, I just want to go a little bit deeper on that thought uh, this evening to finish up that thought. Uh, John chapter 6 and verse number 63. It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. Father, I love you tonight. Thank you for your word. I ask you to add your anointing upon your word, your servant to preach, and your servants to hear. And we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We ended this morning with a few questions. And we began to, uh, we looked at this, they are spirit and they are truth. And we talked about this morning a need for us to try the Spirit. So how do we do that was a question that I asked that we have to ask ourselves. How do I try spirits? What do I look for? What will I find in the real that is not present in the imitation? And so we come to the conclusion this morning, not just the title of the message, but you're looking for spirit and life. So we find that the true church, by our very presence, will cause others to live. Why? Because of the living conditions that are found within us as the body of Christ. Those living spiritual conditions that we are born again, new creatures in Christ Jesus, that there's an excitement to know that I have been brought out of darkness into his marvelous light. I've been brought from the dead into life. And so that's been created inside of us. So those two words, their spirit and life, as we end this morning, we said this, they denote nature and effect. That includes activities which are spiritual in nature, and life is that effect and result. So we have not just that nature of the spirit, our, our very nature. Nature has not only been changed, but in effect, it means how we live our life. So if a man or woman, boy or girl, has been changed on the inside, simply put, it's going to show up on the outside. If you've been born again of the Spirit, if the Spirit of God is in you, uh, it's going to be lived out in a life. So tonight we're going to look at uh, the test. So how do we put this to the test? Spirit and life, trying the spirits, uh, how do we do it? So we're going to talk tonight the test uh, of the truth. So we want to go back to 1 John 4 and 1, another verse that we closed with this morning. It says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the Spirit whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. You think about uh, the importance and the emphasis of that verse to tell us that you cannot believe every spirit, but you've got to try them to see if they're even of God. That is talking about some, some things that will totally resemble the truth. Something that looks to be so accurate, he says that you've got to take time and try them to see if they are of the Spirit of God. Because he said in Matthew 24 and 24, if it would be possible, uh, he would deceive the very elect. Uh, so, so this is just not some uh, that we're going to blindly walk through this walk. Uh, it's going to take some determination. It's going to take some commitment. Uh, uh, I talked a few weeks ago on Wednesday night. Uh, we can't make it through being complacent. Uh, and, and just shadow boxing, if you will, just uh, going through the motions. Uh, we've got to get serious about the genuine because the devil and his imitators are serious uh, about their imitation. Uh, they're serious about their deceits. They're serious about their deceptions. Uh, we've got a world out there that is fully focused uh, to brainwash our kids uh, with this mentality of the world. Uh, there's 5%. That number, uh, unfortunately, has gone up in the last few years. It used to be 3%. Now statistics say it's 5%. 5% of America's population claim to be homosexuals. But how much on a daily basis do you hear about homosexuality? It's everywhere. Everywhere. It's every commercial that comes on TV. 
It's everything that is put in your face. They, they've slipped it into this and slipped it into that. Uh, and so, the, listen, the world out there is very... Uh, 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 on that. I don't know the word, uh, but they're on top of that, uh, trying their very best to push uh, this agenda. But you know what else they want to do? Uh, they want to also call it Christians. Uh, we have denominations. Thank God the Church of God is not one of those denominations, because as soon as they get this, I'm checking out. Because uh, we have denominations uh, that let homosexuals uh, preach in their pulpits, ordain homosexuals. Uh, and what is that saying? They're saying there's a mixture, and it's a okay with God. Can I tell you uh, my word says in Romans chapter 1 uh, that it's an abomination uh, in the sight of God. Uh, and so we've got to understand that. They're very intent uh, and they're very diligent uh, and they're not uh, lazy as I said. You can say anything you want about the devil but he is not lazy. Uh, his imps are not lazy. Deceivers are not lazy. Uh, there's people out there working hard to, spare, to take and spread false doctrine but you can't find anybody who wants to take and put in the work to spread the truth. They'll ride up. You'll see them riding through your neighborhood on their bicycles right? to spread a false doctrine. And we look at them, they're out there spreading false doctrine. When's the last time you've seen some Church of God folks, Assembly of God folks out trying to tell the truth? offsetting the truth. So, so it's everywhere. This false doctrine, this, he said, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but you've got to try them. The test of everything religious is how far does it really go in making men and women spiritual? People don't like this, but God has not come uh, for our happiness. He's not concerned with our happiness. Uh, his concern is with our holiness how spiritual we are. Uh, he said that uh, don't worry about what you'll eat, what you'll put on, and all of these other things, the, the things that are necessities of the flesh that we strive for. Uh, we think we need better position, a better job, better opportunities. Uh, why? So we can provide for the flesh. Uh, God said you got it backwards. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, uh, and I'll supply all of your needs. Uh, I will take care. God is more than able uh, to promote you when it's time to promote you, uh, to to take care of you uh, when it needs to be done. We talked about that Wednesday night. Uh, David wasn't too concerned with his promotion, uh, and he was not very concerned with Saul's demotion. He said that's in God's hands. And so we've got to understand that, that it's about making us, does it make us more spiritual? So here where our text is found in John chapter 6. John chapter 6 is a long book of the Bible. It's a long one. And I'm not going to read all of John chapter 6 to you tonight, but right there where our text is found, and really just in the heart of, that tells you how long it is, we find, well, it's not at the heart, it's near the end, 63, that we find that uh, the text here, that he's, Jesus is doing something throughout this whole chapter. He's putting his finger on the fact that all these religious people, the Jewish nation at that time, all they had did not take, make them spiritual people. Now that was news to them because they have kept the law. You think of Saul of Tarsus and he came along. He thought that he was doing right. He knew the law, knew it well, and they thought that's what makes them spiritual. The law came from God, but the law in the hands of man became flawed. That's why Jesus had to come. And so here they are. They think they're very religious. They might have been very religious, but they weren't very spiritual. And that's what Jesus came to do. He said, I didn't come to destroy the law because the law was right, but I've come to fulfill the law. What did he say? I've come to tell you and show you and live the law, what the law is supposed to be out in front of you, not that flawed law uh, that's been put in, in the hands of man, uh, that man has taken it to make them dictators and make us the only. See, the Jews had taken it to say, well, because of the law and because our uh, ability to interpret, because of uh, our Sanhedrins and all of this, uh, we're the only ones. No Gentile can be and no Samaritan can be. In. It's only the Jews. Uh, not the uncircumcised, not this one, not that one, uh, only us. And they had made it about them, uh, and they had a hierarchy of religious system of that time, uh, big eyes and little U's. Uh, and Jesus said, no, 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 we're going to put our finger on this thing. Uh, and in about John uh, chapter 6, right around 63, our text, uh, and a little further, Jesus begins to say, if you're not willing to drink my blood and eat my flesh, you can have no part with me. 
And John 6, 66, they basically said this. This is me paraphrasing, putting in my own words. Ooh, gross. Because it said in John 6 and 66 that many of his disciples walked away and followed him no more. Not the 12, but many that were following him up to that point said, you had me until you said that. I'm done. Why? Because it was all natural thinking. It was all about what I can do to make myself religious, uh, what I can do uh, to make myself holy. Uh, so what they're thinking is, I've got to eat that dude's fingers and toes and drink his blood. I'm out. But that's not what Jesus was saying. They, they, couldn't under, they couldn't understand. Let me, let me get there. He's putting his finger on the fact uh, that what they had did not make them spiritual and did not make them living people uh, in that true sense. He's saying, in effect, uh, there is a great gap between all of this that you think is right and true spirituality, and he came to bridge that gap. He said this gap. Jesus came to say this gap has to be bridged, and the only way it can be bridged is with the truth. Well, it seemed to them it looked like the real says all the right things, it's going through the motions, but here's the question, is the heart changed? In, in Jesus' day, and still today, it's the same thing. You, you can look at it, you say, well, it looks real. You, you say, they're saying all the right things. You can watch the Terminally Brain Dead Network for a couple of hours and think, man, they're saying the right, that's TBN for those who don't know the initials. They sit there and think, well, it sounds right, it sounds pretty good. Sounds okay. I've offended some of you because you like TBN. I'm sorry. I don't watch it. They, they, but we find it's going through the motions. But then you say, wait a minute. Has it changed? Has it been a change of heart? Is there an about face from the world or is it an inclusion, a mixture? You always better be careful when they're, we want to incorporate some of the world's ideas into this and have a mixture there. So there it is. Has there been a change of heart? So think about this. Think about it when it's not called up. You've got to not, not just put somebody else uh, uh, under that, uh, that microscope of looking at this and, and looking at them through that, that lens of, of looking at somebody else, but this is also a lens that we turn back to ourselves. Uh, that lens called the mirror. And we begin to ask these questions. It's not just something that, I, that I'm looking out and I'm looking at, at somebody else's life or somebody else's life, but also it's something that I have to do a self-evaluation on as well, and I have to ask these questions. Uh, when not caught up in a religious atmosphere, what is its desire? When you're looking and you're trying spirits, it's the test of spirits, but you also have to turn that inwardly and ask that question. When I'm not in church, when, when, when I don't have on my church clothes, and I'm being churchy, right? We, we know all the church talk. And I, I think that we many times as people that go to church are guilty to think everybody knows our church talk. There's a lot of people out there, they don't know our church talk, but unfortunately, a lot of church folks only use church talk in church. I, I've heard some church folks when they didn't know pastor was around the corner, and I was like, whoa, that ain't church talk. And so... When we begin to think about that and we begin to evaluate and assess others, uh, he said, now, when you're looking at somebody else's life, don't forget your own porch, right? So when, when I'm not caught up in a religious atmosphere, uh, when, when I'm not here for church and there's not a call to worship, uh, and, and when I'm not here on Sunday morning, what, what is the desire? What is the push for? What is the main goal of that ministry? This is why we have to test those spirits. But also, what is my main goal? What, what is my purpose? When, when outside of the church and what outside of the worship service, uh, any true born-again believer uh, should not be able to answer that question and say, what do you mean outside of the atmosphere of the spiritual of the church? Well, I am never outside of the atmosphere of the spiritual, should be the answer of the born-again believer. Church is not a place I attend. Uh, worship is not a, a 20 minute segment in the church service on Sunday morning. Uh, worship is a lifestyle. Uh, church, I am the church. I am the body of Christ. I'm a member of the kingdom of God. Uh, and that's whether I'm at 4579 State Road 21 uh, or if I'm at uh, another church building or if I'm at 2728 Howard Road uh, or if I'm at 3225 Silverado Circle uh, or whatever your address is. Uh, 
uh, and whatever Walmart's address is, uh, whatever the schoolhouse address is, uh, whatever your job's address is, uh, wherever I'm at, that's the atmosphere. uh, And my desire uh, is to be uh, what God wants me to be, uh, not just in this building, uh, but I want to be on the job that God wants me on. I want my kids in the school that God wants them in. I want to walk in the way that he wants me to walk, talk, and live. When it's lined up with that, when it's all about God and not about man, we're on the right track. They're passing the test. What is the nature? What is its nature? So you have to ask yourself, what is my nature? Am I I'm more caught up in me? If you're selfish, you need to get that under the blood. If it's all about you all the time, that there's some uh, TV stations, they'll run this deal, and it's, you know, they've got marathon going on. They'll say, all Andy Griffith, all day long, you know, or whatever the show is. And you make it all me, all day long, every day. That's a problem. That's a problem because it's not all about you. You say, well, pastors, it's supposed to be all about you. No, it's not all about me. One man, we had pastor appreciation one time, and he thought he was whispering in the back. Uh, he whispered to the brother beside him uh, at about this tone. He said, I'm glad we only do this once a year. And I heard him, and I said, amen, <laughs> me too. Because it's not all about me. It's about him. It's about lifting up the kingdom of God uh, and lifting up uh, that that is of him. And so we have to see that the rest of the value of everything religious rests on one thing. How far is it producing spiritual men and women? See, we're so called up on, on the measuring of numbers. Uh, oh, they've got a big crowd. They must be it. Not if it's not creating spiritual people. Not if, it's not, not if it's not creating spiritual men. And when we talk about growth, uh, and we talk about uh, growth, we better be talking about spiritual growth. Uh, some folks would come along and say, Pastor Jamie, you've been there eight and a half years, and y'all, y'all almost broke 50, but you hadn't quite broke 50. You're not uh, growing. I say, well, I have to dare to differ with you because I've seen spiritual growth, and that's what we're after. Oh, you want everybody to grow. You want everybody to come. You want everybody to be a part. Uh, But when it's all about just uh, getting numbers and about who's got the best numbers, uh, we're not in a competition with the church up the street. Uh, We should be working in harmony with the church up the street. There's been times that I've said that we should just take all five Church of God in Clay County and pull them together, one body, because that's what we're supposed to be, one body, one body working together together that would probably never never happen but that's just my heart because it's not just about Middleburg it's not just about Clay Hill or Doctors Inlet or Orange Park or Green Cove it's not just about one in particular church but it's about all of us the body of Christ uh, taking and passing that test and re- realizing uh, how far are we producing spiritual men and women uh, Jesus was constantly making that distinction between spiritual and non-spiritual constantly People have asked me over the years, how long are you going to beat that dead horse? Well, Jesus did it for three and a half years of ministry. Every, every moment that he was in, even before that, at 12 years old, he, they were looking for him, and he was pushing that point, spiritual. Spiritual. He was baffling them on his knowledge of that. Why? Because we have to know the distinction between spiritual and non-spiritual. If we don't know the distinction between spiritual and non-spiritual, we'll fall for non-spiritual every time. We'll fall for the phony or the counterfeit. And and he just kept pushing this message. And you back up just a couple chapters to find probably one of the most familiar instances found in Scripture. And that's in John chapter 4 when he's talking to the woman at the well. She recognized him to be religious. Remember I told you this morning I pulled out the church card to buy something? Oh, you have a blessed day. They start talking religion. This woman is, is looking and saying, listen, uh, Jews supposed to have nothing to do with Samaritans. Uh, she's there at the well. What are you even doing here at the well? They, they don't even come by. She's trying to have that conversation. Uh, and then she finds that he's religious, so she tries to talk religious. She might not want to get on that subject with the king of kings. So she begins to try to talk religious. didn't work out too well, right? Because by the time they were done, he said, go tell your husband. Set up. Right? I don't have a husband. You said, you've said well that you don't have a husband. You've had five of them, and the one you're with now, you're shacking up with them. That's not your husband. Uh Uh-oh. 
Shouldn't have gotten in a religious conversation with him. But she tried. Let's look where she tried. In John chapter 4, verse 20 through 24. She's there and she's having this in-depth conversation with the king of kings about religion. She's going to educate him on religion. How about trying that one? Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, she said. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship? Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such as to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, this, this story is a message in all of his own. Now, he does call her out, and he does speak about the, the five wives, but you, or five husbands that you do find, though, that this woman, after this encounter, she starts evangelizing. She goes into the city. She, I imagine that maybe all five of those ex-husbands, she told them. She told everybody, come see a man. And they came. And that city was changed because of this, this encounter. But this encounter did not start off very well for her. She's trying to preach to Jesus. She's trying to preach religion to Jesus and telling him about all of this ceremonial stuff that, that they know all about this mountain. And, and even the well, this is our, Jacob's well. And, and she's just trying. Boy, she's real. She, she'd been at Sunday school. But she missed the point. And so, in effect, Jesus starts talking to her, and he tells her that this mountain, Mount Garrison, nor the temple in Jerusalem. He took her mountain that she worshipped on uh, and the temple that they worshipped in in Jerusalem. Uh, he said, neither one of these, when it's all come down, uh, is not the truth. The truth is only that which is spiritual. He's saying it's not a mountain. Uh, it's not a tabernacle. Uh, it's not a well. Uh, it's not material. Uh, it's not things. Uh, it's not stuff. Uh, he says the truth is that that which is the very nature and essence is spiritual. He's saying only uh, spiritual. Uh, that true worshipers, he said, they're going to arise uh, and true worshipers will worship God uh, in spirit and in truth. Uh, this mountain's not the truth. Jerusalem's not truth. Jacob's not the truth. Uh, understanding something about Jacob's well, uh, they were able to clog up the wells at one point in history uh, where there was no water flowing from Jacob's well. Uh, the Philistines had clogged them up, uh, and they had to be clogged. And I tell you uh, that the Spirit is never clogged up. Uh, you might have to climb to the top of the mountain uh, to experience the victory. Uh, but can I tell you, uh, there is no hindrances uh, of reaching the mountaintops of God. Uh, that those that worship Him, worship Him in spirit and in truth. Uh, he said all of these things are natural, uh, and they will fail. God is not a building. God is not a a mountain. God is not a well. God is not a material. God is not flesh. The very nature of God is spirit. And if you're going to worship the Father, you will worship Him from your spirit. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. A spirit will worship you. Your spirit will cry out. Right now, your flesh, if you gave it the opportunity to respond, it'd say, I want to go home and eat. Because flesh goes after flesh but the spirit says no honey we're here to worship we're here to worship we're here to call upon the lord so we have to find that when spirituality means seeing that's the first thing about it is having eyes to be able to see Ephesians 1 and 8 says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling uh, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance uh, in the saints. Uh, so we look at the context, uh, going a little further in John chapter 6 from where we were uh, to verse 42. We look at the context of the scripture using uh, the context of our, ver our text using this verse, a few verses down in 42. And they said, is not this Jesus? Listen to what they say about him. And is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? Get this. How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? 
it really threw him off when he said before Abraham is, I was. He's not even 50 years old. He's not, how can he talk about Abraham? So here they are. That's one place, and now another place. They're, 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 they're bringing it down to where, where the rubber meets the road. Isn't his daddy, isn't his father Joseph? Well, that's where you messed up. That's where you messed up. Mary's his mother, but his father is not with us. Joseph has taken the responsibility of being his dad here on earth. But his father, he was conceived not of Joseph, but of the Holy Ghost. And so they're looking at this, and they're trying to break it down. Notice that everyone knows. I mean, it, it, was, the, it was the gossip of the town, I guarantee you, when Mary came up pregnant, and Joseph said, not mine, Right? Joseph was, remember, go, go back to December, the Christmas story, or go ahead to December. So, so many had Christmas in July. I know it's August 1st, but some have had Christmas in July. Let's have Christmas on August 1st uh, to think about that Christmas story. Uh, and Mary says, uh, Joseph, uh, I'm pregnant, but don't worry. I haven't been with anybody. That just within me has been conceived of the Holy Ghost. I don't believe you, woman. We're done, was what he would have said. But an angel had appeared to him in his dream, Right? And he told Joseph, he said, Joseph, that that has been conceived in Mary has been conceived of the Holy Ghost. He was going to put her away because he wanted to save embarrassment of himself and everybody. So I guarantee you, I guarantee you the count town gossips knew this whole story. We as Christians say we know the Christian story or the Christmas story. They knew the Christmas story. They were living in that time. But they come back at this time saying, hold on, this is Jesus, the son of Joseph. And nobody spoke up. Nobody spoke up, said, no, you remember, he was conceived of the Holy Ghost. Not a one. It says, whose father and mother we know. Well, you don't know his father, or you wouldn't be questioning it. He said, how then, he saith, I came down from heaven. They had not the faintest, foggiest idea of who he was in a heavenly way. They're looking at Jesus the man. They, they, they might as well... I watch a lot of baseball, and there's a lot of foreign guys in baseball. And you know how many guys are named Jesus? I said, that ain't Jesus. So that, if to their mind, he was no different than, than Jesus playing first base. We know his mom and dad. He, he, came, he, he lived next door to me. I've seen him out there in Joseph's carpentry shop toting two-by-fours. And here he is talking all of this stuff. How is it? He says he came down from heaven. He didn't come down from heaven. I heard him crying in the manger, right? Why? Because they're physical eyes. They need to see, but they ain't seeing. And, and too many today are that same. There, there's some folks still today who says, well, Jesus was a good man. He was a good prophet, but he wasn't the Messiah. Even Jews today, he, he's not the Messiah they, they have all of this false belief of who he is or what he is, uh, but they had not the faintest idea of him in a heavenly way. Why? Because they could not see beyond what was earthy. They could not see uh, beyond the eyes of the flesh. Uh, can I tell you, that was not just out there in the realm of that religious system. It was in the realm of the 12 that was with him. Remember Thomas? Seeing is believing for Thomas. And many of us are the same way. We can give Thomas a bad rap, but we've been the same way. If I don't see it for myself, you tell me something far-fetched, I say, i got to see it. I need to see it for myself. And so that's what they were doing. They, they wanted to see. They wanted to compare it to physically. Now, that may, that may be the case in some physical things, but that cannot be the case in spiritual things. Uh, we walk by faith and not by sight, not physical sight. But faith is spiritual sight, spiritual. Uh, spirituality is the first feature in seeing. Uh, and so in seeing, uh, we've got to understand uh, that we know that there's symbols everywhere. All over the world, they've used symbols. Coming here tonight, you've had to pay attention to symbols. You took your driving test. There were signs, but it didn't have the words on it, right? If you took the driving test and it had the words on it, you had one up on me. Because it just showed the stop sign, and you had to say, that's the stop sign. Detour sign, that's the detour, the yield sign. You had to know, not necessarily by the words, 
but by the symbols. And that is used everywhere. Symbolisms are everywhere. This matter of symbolism is very developed. It's come to a place that is, it's developed. It's, uh, it's how people do uh, signature to things and, and stuff. I, I've been watching baseball my whole life, but I never knew that the Milwaukee Brewers, I always thought that they just had a glove on their hat. Well, it's an M, a B and an M, an M and a B that makes a glove on their hat, a symbol says Milwaukee Brewers. Yes, I'm a dummy, but I never knew that. It was a symbol. So it's everywhere. It's in, in, in grocery stores. It's on the Internet. It, it's all over the world, but it's an ancient thing, too. It goes back uh, to, to ancient days. Everything has a symbolic representation. Uh, it, it goes back into the ancient world. You can go into those caves, and uh, people will tell you cavemen put these symbols on the walls. No, they didn't. Uh, it, it's just symbolism that was there. Uh, it was in a process of time. Uh, it was probably what we'll get into in the next few weeks when Saul and his armies hiding out. Uh, imagine how big those caves was. Uh, and all of Saul and his armies in that cave and David and his armies in that cave, they didn't even know each other was in that cave. They're doodling and they're writing messages and symbols. We've gone back to it. We use emojis instead of texting. We're right back to it. It doesn't require the one who gave the symbol to interpret them. It's left for interpretation. See, all of, all of these Symbols are put out there. Even, even some symbolisms that people use that when they, in texting, you better make sure you know what, what you're doing when you take those acronyms or those symbols in texting. And, and make sure that, that, that you put those things in there. People's using uh, uh, just, just some, I put one not too long ago that, that people use, and I let my anointing overflow is what I hope it's, it's standing for because a lot of Christians are using it, right? LMAO. Let my anointing overflow is what it means for Christians, right? No, that's not what it means, but hey, Christians are using that. OMG. Oh, no, we don't use the Lord's name in vain. It's a symbol. We don't think anything about the symbol. We don't connect it with spiritual things. We can't afford to do that. That affects our testimony. Do we know that one, one error, one mistake uh, uh, of using the wrong symbol and using it in, in the wrong fashion uh, and trying, as I said, God, that God will not wink at ignorance. We've got to make sure that we know so it doesn't require one to gave the symbols to interpret them. The Holy Spirit of God gave divine truths and principles in this way, but in understanding that God did this, uh, he gave symbols, he gave types and shadows, uh, but he never left it to private interpretation. God put these things in place, uh, and he said, I didn't put it there for you to break the Morse code, for you to try to figure it out with knowledge and intellect. He said, there's only one way. This Bible is full of symbolisms. It's full of types and shadows. It's full of things that, that we have to understand. We have to understand when the Bible speaks of trees that is talking of men. We, we have to understand. But how, how do we understand those things? Not by man, not by intellect, but by the Spirit beginning to show this. The divine truths and principles in this way. So we we're never meant to, to, for these things are never meant to be an end in themselves. What does that mean? It means that God's not called us to worship symbolisms and symbols. A great comparison of this is praise and worship is a great symbol. Right? It's a great expression of our love for God. But God has never called us to praise and worship, praise and worship. What do you mean, Pastor? People really get into the praise and worship part of the service and fall asleep while you preach. You know what that tells me? They praise and worship. They're God's praise and worship. Their God, as long as the atmosphere is charged uh, with the music and with the sound and with that, that taps their feet and, uh, and snaps their finger and makes them clap their hands. Uh, but when the Word of God is there, time to take a nap. This is what it's all about, the Word. Don't get me wrong, there's word and praise and worship, but if we're not careful, we'll take that symbol of worship and we'll make it all about that. Uh, and it's not who we're worshiping, uh, it's about what we're doing. Uh, so we're not seeking signs and wonders. He, he said it's not to be tied up, it's not meant for those symbols uh, to be in themselves. Uh, because somebody wears a cross around their neck, uh, that does not make them a Christian. Just because they got a fish on the back of their car doesn't make them a Christian. 
Just because you got a T-shirt that says uh, John 3, 16, or, or y'all need Jesus, or whatever your T-shirt says. We went on that the other night. But anyway, uh, whatever your T-shirt says, that doesn't make you a Christian. It's just a symbol. It's just a symbol. That's not the end and within it's itself. Oh, they must be saved. They got on a Jesus shirt. They got on a Team Jesus shirt. I saw a video the other day of a guy who had on a Team Jesus shirt. And he made this video, and he'd come out of the bank, and he was very upset, I'll put it this way, with his bank. Because his bank was saying that there is a coin shortage. He said, well, if there's a coin shortage, I'm going to bring you coins. Our bank will let you just bring coins. I just take them a bag of coins, and they count them. I'm loving the coin shortage because I don't have to roll them. And I wouldn't roll them anyway. Sister Amy would, and she kind of likes rolling them. But anyway... He said that I came in there, and I had them separated into little baggies. Separated up, whatever goes in. I don't even know how many goes in each one. Quarter, however many quarters in one, and how many dimes in one, and nickel. He said, I had them all separated, but I didn't have any rollers. He said, they didn't offer me rollers. They didn't offer me any of that. They just said that the coins have to be rolled. That upset him, I guess, because he made a Facebook video about it. And he said, I've got something to tell you, whatever his bank was. And he told them they were number one. Right there on the video. I said, team what? Team who? He had one symbolism given one message and another symbolism given a very different message, isn't it? So don't get caught up in in symbols and symbolism. They're not the ends within themselves. Uh, You can't say, well, they got on a Jesus shirt. They must be all right. They're wearing a cross. They must be all right. They they got that bumper sticker on their car. Uh, Honk, if you love Jesus, they may be all right. Or they are. We're not seeking after this stuff. We're seeking after him. We said this morning that there's these signs and wonders that people are chasing after. They'll go all over the world. Uh, Oh, we're going to buy tickets, and we're going to go see him. He's going to blow on us, and and we're going to be healed, and he's going to kidney punch me, and my kidneys are going to be healed, and and all of this is going to happen. People are running here and there for all of this stuff. Signs and wonders. You may have remembered Brownsville. Go to Brownsville. They saw uh, gold dust falling from the ceiling. They're barking like dogs. I'm not driving over there to see that. I want to see Jesus. When I get to heaven, I'm not going to ask to see angel dust. I'm going to say, I want to see Jesus, the one that died for me. So before I get to heaven, I just want to see Jesus. Well, when I find, as we said many times before, that when the Father is looking at the church in Revelation, he's not looking for angel dust. He's not looking for people barking like dogs. He's not looking for a laughing spirit, they call it. I watch one. This guy just starts busting out laughing, falls out off the piano. I said, what's wrong with you, dude? What is wrong with you? Make us look like a bunch of cornflakes. That they need to come in and straight jack. I understand Pentecostal fire will burn and, and, and they will do some strange things. Uh, but, but we're not flocking to this junk to say, this is, this is what I'm looking for. Uh, but Scripture tells us signs and wonders follow those that believe. Uh, it's not something that I conjure up. Uh, you'll never hear from this pulpit talk in your heavenly language uh, because you have no control over that. Uh, uh, we can't begin to put on demand and say these things uh, and say, oh, look, it's, it's falling from the ceiling. I guarantee you that angel dust didn't fall from the ceiling. Somebody was dropping it from the ceiling. People were barking like a dog because they wanted to bark like a dog and somebody convinced them and messed with their mind enough to bark like a dog. And all of this other nonsense... We're not seeking after signs and wonders. I'm not driving halfway across the country just in hopes that I can bust out laughing in a church service that I had the laughing spirit. It's nonsense. But I do want to be where the Holy Ghost is moving. I I can't tell you that, that I've never laughed in the spirit because I have. Oh, there's a difference between the genuine and an imitation. You know it. I can't tell you I've never danced in the spirit because I have. But you've got to know the difference. And too many, too many preachers, uh, and, and, and they'll tell me, you better watch it, son. I don't care. You got to be careful. You don't want to offend. There's people that's going to sit in your congregation that believe in that stuff. Well, they don't need to. It's the Word. 
imitation, phony. Remember back to our text, he, he, or back there to, to what we was talking about in First John. Uh, he said you got to try the spirits. And, and why did it get down to that? He said because it may look right, it may seem right, it may draw a crowd. And we think, well, if everybody else is going after it, I, I know brother so-and-so, and uh, he, he's a pretty spiritual guy, and, and, and he's going over there, so it must be all right. And, uh, and we begin to fall into this trap of it. Uh, listen, we've got to compare spiritual things to spiritual things. Uh, if you're chasing after symbolisms, uh, if you're chasing after signs and wonders. Uh, that's not what we're seeking for. He said, seek Jesus. Uh, Paul was told, uh, and he taught, uh, preach Jesus and him crucified. He said, I don't have to put on some show to draw people. He said, lift him up. As Moses was lifted up in the wilderness, as he lifted up the rod, the serpent in the wilderness, even as the Son of Man be lifted up. He said, you lift up Jesus, and he will draw all men unto him. Not coming to if you come, watch. There'll come a point in the service that pastor will do a backflip. If you come waiting for this pastor to do a backflip, it ain't happening. It will be the Spirit. We all know Brother Henry Thornton. Brother Henry Thornton, he never, it was never put out before service. Come to service, and, and, and our, our preacher tonight is going to do somersaults across the front of the church. Nobody put that. That wasn't... The thing that was put out, it wasn't promoting like the, the, the promoting of these revivals. Come to our church and watch this. That wasn't it. But man, the Spirit of God fell one night in the service. We was in service with Brother Henry. And you know Brother Henry, he always called him Fred Flintstone. Just all, to me, he always looked like Fred Flintstone. Never a hair out of place. And I, I remember as a teenager, I had to, couldn't wait to the moment to ask him. We got close enough to him, went on vacation with him, and I just had to know, how do you keep every hair in place? And he told me the hairspray he used. Kept every bit of it in place. But the Spirit of God moved on Brother Henry, and he was short in stature and probably just as wide as he was tall back then, he, before all of his heart surgery and everything. Pretty hefty guy. And he just began doing somersaults. Across the front of that building. Wasn't in flesh. It wasn't in Henry. You go ask Henry Thornton to do a somersault, I guarantee you he couldn't do one. But signs and wonders follow those that believe. He wasn't putting on a show. He wasn't trying to show out for anybody. But the Spirit just moved upon him. And too many have got that mixed up. They're, they're trying to, to draw in with signs and wonders and with symbols uh, and understanding that there is something there that we're seeking him. He has a meaning. He had meaning behind every symbol, and only he can interpret them. They're, they're the symbols of the Bible, they're important, but we can't look to man for the interpretation. We've got to look to God. Uh, the imitation Christianity that we talked about this morning has become so fascinated with these symbols symbols and these types, these signs and these wonders uh, without any true interpretation from the Spirit of God. And that result is mysticism. You know what mysticism is? Very close to witchcraft. Very close to that of casting spells and all of that nonsense. As Revelation, as he said in Revelation, it's gotten very close to being a tabernacle of Satan, a, a place where a bunch of strange birds it's what the writer of Revelations basically said. It comes down to just everything is drawled into it. Jesus saw that when he stepped into the temple. He saw it was full of that kind of stuff. He drove them out. Jesus is not here in the flesh. We are the body of Christ, and it's up to us when it's happening in his church. It's up to us. Somebody's got to stand up and drive it out to say that's, that's a spiritual disease. It's going to not here. No, that's got to go. That's not going to happen here. That, 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 that cannot happen here. It's our business. Our business uh, under the guidance of the Holy Ghost is to extract from these symbols uh, the practical truths of God. Uh, and we should never handle this Bible in any part without aiming at, by the help of the Holy Spirit, uh, reaching practical issues. We must use it for what it was intended for. We should never use the Word of God for anything except for spiritual things. If somebody's posting on Facebook, they usually use one of these symbols, IMO. So this is an IMO, in my opinion. I've had a couple of businesses that I've had over the years, pressure washing business that I had, lawn service. But what I refused to do with those businesses was attach a scripture to my business card. He said, well, you're a Christian. You should have. 
I was not going to use the Bible to promote my work, my job. I should be that open epistle. It shouldn't be, well, we can trust him because he's got Scripture on his card. They should be able to know that they trust you or me when they see the life and the integrity of what we do and how we do it and how we live. It shouldn't be a, a scripture. A lot of people, uh, I understand some people have no, no intentions. That's just IMO. That's not a thus saith the Lord. That's an IMO. I don't preach my opinion very much, but that's me to, to say that. I know some people, they're not thinking anything of that, and that may be them, but for me personally, I don't want anybody uh, to come back to that point uh, that they, there has to be a scripture attached to it for them to know this is a Christian business. They should know it. As soon as they encounter us, they should know it. So we should be aiming for spirit, reaching for practical issues. I got off subject. Let me get back to what we're on. The very heart of our message, the message of Pentecost, is a living message. A living message. What did he tell us to do in Romans 12, 1 and 2? Present our bodies living sacrifice. We are an open epistle. As I told you about my friend in Australia, she'd cover that Bible up and say, it's alive, it's alive, it's alive. The Word of God is alive. It should be alive in us. It should be alive through us. We should be alive in the Spirit, not walking in, in death and disgruntled. And there, there should be no disgruntled employees in the household of faith. Understanding that tonight, that it is the government of God at work through us, the true church. Pentecost is this. We've said this over and over again in the last several weeks. Pentecost is God's Son revealed through the church by the Holy Ghost. And the inclusive result of that is quite simple. It's life. It's life. He said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. So what Pentecost is, our Pentecostal experience, our Pentecostal walk, our Pentecostal life is God's Son being revealed through the church by the Holy Ghost. When the heavenly order and principles are established, there's going to be life. That's the message of Pentecost. And only spiritual men and women have any place, any right, any authority, any knowledge, or any liberty to touch the things of the kingdom of heaven. That's been the case throughout the Word of God. If you could find him, you would ask Uzziah, and he would tell you that very quick. He should have never touched the Ark of the Covenant, right? It hit that pothole, and he reached for it. It wasn't his place, and it cost him. Too many, too many are trying to handle the things of God that, that are not supposed to handle the things of God. The gospel is gathered up in this. John 3 and 7, you must be born again. John 3 and 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Everything outside of that, everything that is... In that, in the flesh, is outside and is to be excluded. A born-again life is a spiritual life. It's a heavenly life that is in full appreciation of Christ. That born-again life, it's all about Jesus. No longer I. I've been born again of an incorruptible seed. That's that vital and that real purpose of what we are as Pentecostals. When you say Pentecostals, people automatically... Come up with the outward manifestations of what Pentecost is, right? Speaking in tongues. You're Pentecost. Y'all speak in tongues? They want to know more about that, right? That, that is. But what Pentecost is, the real purpose and the vital purpose and the full appreciation of it is that we uh, understand that we must be born again and that is flesh is flesh and that is spirit is spirit and we have a full appreciation of Christ and who he is and we want the full gospel. Born again people don't chase after signs and wonders. Why not? Because signs and wonders follow them. Amen? We don't have to chase after signs and wonders because signs and wonders follow them. As I said last week, there's not a born-again believer who sits under the sound of my voice, if you're born again, that you do not have power. The devil will try to convince you that you have no power, but if you've been born again, you've been filled with his spirit, you've got the power in the name of Jesus. The devil just wants to make you think that you are powerless, or he wants you to imitate a power that you don't have. He don't care which route that he has to go just as long as he has you on the sidelines. Or if he has you off the sidelines, he has you wrong, running the wrong way. Running the wrong way. 
Have you ever seen that? Uh, uh, you see that sometimes in, in kids' sports. I've seen uh, one where a kid, he hit the ball and he ran to third base first. For those who don't know about baseball, you run the first base first. He ran to third base and he was real happy, but he ran the wrong way. I've seen kids playing soccer and they scored the goal and they was very happy. The only problem, it was the wrong goal. Wrong goal. That's, that's humorous, but it's not humorous when there's people going through all the most. Think about all the effort of that little boy running down the field, kicking the ball, everybody's screaming at him. He's thinking they're cheering him on, but they're telling him to turn around. And he kicks the, into the wrong goal, and he's celebrating, and everybody else goes, oh. That's funny. But in the spiritual realm, it's not funny because they're putting forth, you think about that, they're putting forth all that effort and all of that energy running in the wrong way, celebrating about scoring goals for the other team. The devil saying, scored another goal for me, and they think they've done something spiritual. Why? Because they're deceived. They're deceived. They're drawn away by it, going through all of those motions uh, and understanding that we don't do that. Uh, if we're going to be true servants of God, we're going to discover some things uh, under the hand of the Spirit. And I want to, to this is my first closing. We're going, to, we're going to wind it down, so don't start the music yet. Four things. Four things that we discover under the hand of the Spirit. First, the authority must be with Him. Isaiah 9 and 6 says, And the government shall be upon His shoulders. His shoulders. So that authority is His. Number two, the strength must be His and His alone. The flesh, from our text, that said what? The flesh profiteth. I've read this text like five times a day. Put it up on the screen for me, please. John six sixty three. I'm going to start over. I'm going to go back to this morning and preach this morning again. It's, the flesh profiteth nothing. The profiteth nothing, and nothing means the strength of intellect will never get us through. That means nothing. The flesh profiteth nothing means the strength of will will never get us through. The strength of emotion. I'll be good in ministry because I'm an emotionally stable person. It will never get you through. Only spiritual strength. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. And they are life. Nothing else. Flesh profiteth nothing. Acts 1 and 8 First part of the verse said, you shall receive power after you're good and emotionally strong. No. You shall receive power after you learn a lot. No. You shall receive power when you've got a strong will. No, that's not what it says at all, is it? You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Well, I'm a pretty strong person, and I can handle just about anything. We've talked about this in job interviews. What's your strength? Well, we can babble on for 10 minutes on our strength. What's your weaknesses? Oh, I really can't think of any weaknesses. Well, I'm, I'm strong, and I'm powerful, and I have this ability, and so I'll be all right. Well, Zechariah 4 and 6 tells us it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. The strength must be his and his alone. Number three, we will learn that we know nothing unless the Holy Spirit of God teaches us. Remember what the Holy Spirit is. It's all three. It takes all three of them working together. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost working Man, working together. 1 Corinthians 2 and 11 tells us, For what man knoweth the things of a man saveth the spirit of man which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. You won't know it unless the spirit reveals it to you. You will be deceived unless the spirit reveals it to you. That's why that you need to be in a spirit-filled church under spirit-filled preaching, that you need to surround yourself with spirit-filled friends, because we will learn that we know nothing unless the Spirit teaches us. And fourth, a spiritual person is one under the absolute control of the Holy Ghost. 
under absolute control of the Holy Ghost. There is no such thing as a Sunday morning Christian. There is no such thing as I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. It's just not the case. Because if you're an abs- under absolute control of the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, you've taken an about face from sin. He's cleansed you. He's washed you. You, you know, when you wash those babies up and you get them ready for church, you're going to make sure that they don't go out there and jump in the first mud hole. Right? They're going to try. That's the same thing that God deals with. He gets us all cleaned up. And you know what we do? If he, he turns and lets us go on how we want to do it, we'll be in the first mud hole. We'll be in the first mud hole. But we have to understand that we've got to be in an absolute control of the Holy Ghost. What does that mean? That means that we have to be in direct communication with Him. My mom always liked to keep us within a correction length, to say to speak, so to speak. I'll line you out. Stay close enough that I can line you out. You've seen people out there, they've got their kids on leashes, and that upsets some people. So they're, they're, not, they're not dogs. If you're not careful, a kid, moment, they're gone. I'd rather see one on a leash than one gone. Ab- under absolute, parents want to make sure they are under absolute control. They don't want any distraction. So listen, I want to be under absolute control of the Spirit. People can tell me, well, that's a crutch. You're tied down. Uh, uh, I've been freed from all of that. I've heard people say it, that, 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 that that's legalism, and, uh, and, and I've been liberated. And, and listen, if that's, that's liberated, I don't want to be liberated. I want to be tied in with the Holy Ghost. I want to be grounded. I want to be anchored in the Word of God. If I'm in bondage, leave me in bondage. I'm bound by Jesus Christ. I'm bound by the blood of the Lamb. I'm bound by the power of the Holy Ghost. A spiritual person is under absolute control of the Holy Ghost. If your Holy Ghost lets you do whatever you want to do, it's an imitation. Your Holy Ghost is a knockoff. One person said it this way, uh, if your Holy Ghost will let you speak in tongues and run around church Sunday night uh, and run everybody down all week, you got the wrong Holy Ghost. There's an imitation out there, church. There's an imitation, and this is how you test the spirits. You line them up with spiritual. Is there spirit? Is there life? Is it edifying the kingdom of God? Or is it exalting and lifting up man? In closing tonight, you can stand with me because this really is closing. Spirit and life, spirituality and livingness is what we've talked about today. These two things are linked all the way through your Bible from Genesis to Revelation. All the way through. Didn't just show up in the New Testament. It's from Genesis to Revelation. When these things, spirit and life, when they're restored, we have restored the message of Pentecost. So we need to approach this altar tonight testing, testing, the truth the test of truth testing trying every spirit that presented itself to us as truth with this verse this is the way we do it with this verse on our heart and our mind first john 4 and 1 we read it earlier beloved believe not every spirit don't believe every wind of doctrine that blows just because it may look right may sound right don't don't be so quick to believe it because it quoted the scripture Don't believe it. But he said, but try the spirits, whether they have God. If they're of God, I'm on board. If they're not, I'm out. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. So you've got to look at it. But we can't just look at it, look at them, and look at what's coming from the outside. We really have to do inventory. On the inside, what have we already allowed in to make up the character of who we are? Has it been spirit? Or have I let the flesh let some stuff in that's religious, that's not very spiritual? That looked right, but it's not right. It's got to go. I don't know about you, but every day when I kneel down to prayer, first thing that I pray is this. Very first thing when I pray in the morning is, Lord, Search me. Search me. I've been preaching for over 25 years, over 30 years. I've been a Christian for a long time. 
but I still pray that every morning. Search me and know my heart. Try me. Know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. Why? Because I want to be led in a way which is everlasting. Oh, let that be our prayer. That's, that's the testing of the Spirit. Lord, did something get past the door? Did something get past the gate? Did I, did I allow something? In carnality, did I allow something in that is not supposed to be there? If it is, burn out the draws, burn out the impurities, burn out the imperfections. A lot of people don't want to pray like that because that's uncomfortable. Because it may be something they have to get rid of, something they have to deal with, something that convicts them. We've said it last week, there's a lot said about the praising church, but not a lot about the praying church. Oh, because when we begin to pray, God begins to convict, He begins to deal with us. Flesh begins to get mad because we might have had to go and clean out our movies, our music, our books, right? Our clothes. People don't want to get that close. Oh, I, I just want to be religious. No, I want to be under complete control of the Holy Ghost because there's a world out there that needs us, church to restore the message of Pentecost. The thing that the psalmist said is restore my soul. If we're ever going to see the church restored, the gospel restored, this world restored, it's got to start right here. Restore me. So maybe tonight you say, man, I need some restoration. I need some restoration. There's, there's some things I know I've let in and they've got to be burned out. Will you come with that verse in your heart testing the spirits to see if they're of God? And that song that, that I sung last time, I sung, Spirit of God, into my heart, burn out the troughs, take me apart. How many is willing to pray that way? Tear me down, if you have to, God, to build up that that is pleasing to you. Not my will, but thy will be done. Father, that has to be the heart of us as your people tonight, under complete control of the Holy Ghost. Lord, if I control it, it's going to be out of control. If I try to take the reins, it's going to be utter chaos. If I try to do it in my own knowledge or intellect, I know that I'm sure to mess it up. But if I'm led by the Spirit, if I am led by the Holy Ghost, you're going to lead us into all truths. Lord God, help us to be so careful to know that there are false doctrines. There is those that will say, Lord, Lord, and it may seem to say the right things and may appear to be right. But we have to seek you to see if they're right or if they're wrong. Lord, if they're right, we want to bind together with them and accomplish ministry. But if they're wrong, we're going to avoid being drawn into that. Help us to be sure that we've not allowed anything into this vessel that is unpleasing to you. And if it is, burn it out as we pray in these altars tonight. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. How many will come tonight and say, Lord, teach me to try the spirits in the day to head. But Lord, if I've let anything get in here that don't need to be in here, deal with it tonight. Reveal it to me. Show it to me because I want to be under your complete control. I want to be in your complete control, Holy Ghost. Will you come?